Well, last time we ended, um, we were talking about some really good stuff. Man, heavy-duty stuff in those first three verses. And uh, first two verses. And we said that there were uh, six reasons why we as believers can rejoice through difficult times and experience hope in the midst of suffering. And we see six of those reasons. Uh, and we begin in verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by the power of God are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I don't know how you can get beyond at least three months worth of sermons in those first five verses. I really don't. It's just, my goodness, there's so much packed in there. Just the word study alone just kind of goes... <laughs> Six reasons why we can uh, find this joy. And the first is we have a living hope. We see it in verse 3. A living hope. Life is hard. We talked about that already this morning. Uh, but nothing that happens to us in this life is part of the final chapter. That chapter is not completed until we arrive in heaven and we step into the presence of God. So, how can we concern ourselves that much over what happens in this temporary world when we know that it's all leading to an eternal destination? This is what Peter calls a living hope. And he reminds us that the reason it's called a living hope is because it is based on what, according to the text? The resurrection of Jesus Christ, yes. If God brought his son through the most painful trials and back from the pit of death itself, certainly then God is able to bring us through whatever we face in this world, no matter how dark it may be or difficult it may be at the time. Now, to someone who is outside of Christ, the entire concept of hope is nothing better than just mental fantasy. It's Disneyland hope when you wish upon a star kind of hope. Um, I sure hope I win the lottery kind of hope. Um, I hope everything works out okay kind of hope. That really isn't hope. That's wishful thinking. But those who are born again in the Lord Jesus, have been promised a living hope through the resurrection from the dead. In other words, that promise is based upon something. The validity of that promise is based upon a reality. And the reality is that Christ is alive. The reality is that Christ rose from the dead. The grave is empty. That's the reality. That is the um, evidence of the promise of hope.
being real. The second thing he tells us is that we have a permanent inheritance. Um, verse 4. This is a permanent inheritance. Um, a secure home in heaven. A place that is under safekeeping, constant surveillance by God. Nothing can destroy it. Nothing can defile it or demolish it or displace it. Isn't that a wonderful relief? Um, this last week, <clears throat> I don't know whether you saw it or not, I think I, I think I forwarded, posted it on my Facebook, but there was a thing from Greg Laurie, uh, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some short videos that he had posted of the aftermath of what happened in Maui. And uh, one, of the, one of the videos that he posted was of uh, Reverend Baldwin's home there in that area. Uh, he was the first missionary uh, in, that, in that area. He was also uh, uh, he was a medical missionary, medical doctor missionary. And his home uh, was the oldest home uh, on the island. And uh, it, was, uh, it was burned down. Um, the only thing left standing were the, the walls and the foundation because he had made it out of stone. Um, the interesting thing about that is uh, Baldwin uh, happens to be uh, my nephew by marriage. And... Uh, uh, Sue's niece uh, married uh, a Baldwin who happens to be the descendant of uh, the Reverend Dr. Baldwin. Um, and uh, um, long story short, they, uh, they made a fortune in uh, the sugar cane market. And so everything over there on the island was Baldwin this, Baldwin that, Baldwin this, Baldwin that. And so that was their estate. Um, and, uh, and now it's not there anymore. You know, um, the inheritance that we have in heaven is not going to be anything like that. Nothing like that. Um, you, you ever been in a situation of where you, uh, uh, you go to the airport and you have a ticket, you get on the plane and someone's sitting in your seat? Hmm? And then you have to try and pry them out of the seat? Or have you been sitting in someone else's seat by accident? Hmm? You ever done that at a, uh, at, a, at a sporting event? Like a baseball game? You know, you have a ticket for one seat, and then there are better seats that, you know, you, you're looking at them, and you're looking at them, and you're looking at them, and no one's sitting in them, and so you just kind of slide over into that seat, you know? And then a half an hour later, somebody comes in late and says, hey, I'm sorry, I think you're in my seat. And you kind of have to slink off. I've done that. <laughs> Never have to worry about that with respect to our inheritance. Um, it's an incredible thing uh, to know that we have that reservation in heaven. Thirdly, he says we have a divine protection. Right there in verse 5, we are protected or kept, okay, uh, in heaven for you, verse 5, who are, who by God's power are being guarded. Uh, this inheritance that we have is being guarded by heaven's lock and key, if you will. We are protected by the most efficient security system available, the power of God. Uh, 
what Russ said was uh, last week we talked about uh, foreknowledge, and here what we're what we're seeing is uh, predestination, that these things are predetermined uh, by that foreknowledge of God, and how that is well rounded out uh, into what we're seeing here, uh, and it's very very true. Um, this, this is an amazing thing. We are, we are protected here. Um, we're, we're not going to be lost in the process of suffering. Um, nothing, not even death, not even the chaos of our culture can weaken or threaten God's ultimate protection over our lives. As I said earlier this morning, nothing happens without God's permission. He knows everything. Uh, no matter what the calamity is, no matter, no matter the disappointment or the pain, uh, or, or whatever kind of destruction even occurs to our bodies at the time of death, our soul is divinely protected. Um, we live in a world that is filled with warfare and strife and terrorism and atrocities. And uh, think, of, uh, think, of, think of the people uh, whose lives um, were, were shattered uh, on September 11th. You know, vaporized <laughs> when the world blew up around them, right? What happens in those tragic calamities? Is our eternal inheritance blown away with our bodies? No. No, not at all. Even though the most horrible of deaths, the one who made us from the dust of the ground, <laughs> by His power and by His promise, is able to deliver us and will deliver us to our eternal destinations. There are two things that help us cope when we run low uh, on hope. Acceptance and trust. Accepting the mystery of hardship when it comes. Don't, 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 don't try to understand it or try to explain it, because many times it won't make any sense at all. Just accept it. And then deliberately trust. My dear friend Carl used to say, Lord, I don't understand you, but I trust you. Uh, next, he says, we have a developing faith. Uh, look, at verse, uh, look at verse 6 and 7. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Even though... <laughs> He says, it indicates that uh, the joy is unconditional. It doesn't depend on the circumstances surrounding it. Even though all of these terrible things might happen, this is still going to be true. That's what he's getting at. Joy comes in spite of our difficulties. Eric has given me some He'll just throw them down to you. Yep.
There, how's that? Better? Oh yeah, much better. Much better. Uh, so, so yes, um, even, <laughs> even gold, right? Uh, who's, that, who's that guy? Divine. William Divine. Devane. William Devane, right? That's why I buy gold from Roslyn Capital. About 4 o'clock in the afternoon, he starts telling you how bad the world is and uh, that you need to buy, buy gold. Um, you know, and, and that's great. And I'm kind of like, well, when you buy gold and they actually send it to you, what do you do with it? You, 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 yeah, you, you, you put, it, put it in the backyard and hope, for goodness sake, you don't forget where you put it. Or that the neighbor's dog doesn't dig it up. Right? That's not much better. Anyway, we're almost done. Uh, we also have um, trials that we need to keep in mind. First of all, trials are necessary uh, to prove the genuineness of our faith. Um, they reveal a lot of things about us, don't they? Uh, they have a way of putting us on our faces before the Lord. Somebody said, pain plants the flag of reality in the fortress of a rebel heart. That's a good statement. Uh, secondly, trials are distressing. Um, and, and as a result of that, they teach us compassion, don't they? Don't you find that you're more compassionate toward people when you yourself have been through similar experiences? I, I thought about that on a very small scale. I, I think about that every time I see somebody driving down the road in an old beater car. And, uh, you know, I used to be, uh, you know, I would uh, say, look at that. Oh, my old piece of junk, that puddle jumper, that old jalopy on the road, blah, 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 until I was driving a few of those. And then I said, Lord, if you ever give me a decent, safe car, I will always make sure that I pray for the person that I see who's driving the old beater. You know, it doesn't, perspective is everything, isn't it? Right? Sure. Sure. Uh, thirdly, uh, trials come in various forms. Uh, various forms. The word is proikolos. It means many colored that's where we get our word polka dot from, interestingly enough. Uh, uh, various forms, various colors. Um, next he says, we have an unseen Savior. Look at verse 8. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. You don't see him, but he's there. Keep in mind the context of which Peter is writing is suffering. So he's not serving up to us some unconsequential theological hors d'oeuvres. No. He's giving us something solid that we can sink our teeth into. He's telling us that our Savior is standing alongside us in the furnace of affliction, and He is there even though we cannot see Him. And so often we find ourselves saying, Lord, where are you? How many times did we read things about people asking, where was God on 9-11? He was right there. Right there. You don't have to see someone all the time in order to love that person, do you? Hmm? A blind mother has never seen her children. But she loves them. You don't have to see someone to believe in them. 
we have never seen a physical manifestation of Jesus. But we love him. And in times of trial, we certainly sense that he is there. And because of that, it causes us to greatly rejoice with inexpressible joy. Inexpressible. <laughs> you, ever, you ever experienced inexpressible joy? Now again, this is the context of suffering. Joy that doesn't make any sense. Joy when the chips are down. Joy when life has fallen apart. Joy when you're at your wit's end. Joy when things are at their worst. Often at, when things are at their worst, that's when God is at his best. Inexpressible joy. Joy that doesn't make any sense. I forget which Roman it was that made the comment about Christians as they were being thrown to the lions, as they were being killed by the gladiators. All of those horrific things happening to them, and yet they have such joy on their faces. I'm going to meet Jesus. Lastly, we have a guaranteed deliverance. Look at verse 9. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Um, that isn't the kind of delivery... Oh, I hate this thing. It's pretty sad when the Bible is so heavy that it messes with the stand. God's word has substance, right? That's right. I didn't hear what you said. Oh, that's it. Yes. Yes, that's right. It's all MacArthur's notes. We'll blame, we'll blame it on that. Right. Uh, guarantee. That's not what you get from the airline when it comes to baggage. How many of you have ever had lost bags? Hmm? Oh, yeah. It is no fun. And it doesn't matter whether they tell you, well, we'll pay you for it, and we'll do this, and we'll do that. And oh, I remember once I flew to New Hampshire to see Dad and, and uh, <laughs> didn't have my bags until the night before I left to come home. And it had stickers all over it. It went to the other coast. It was crazy. Nope, 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 nope. Guaranteed arrival. No. Nope. When it comes to spiritual delivery, you don't have to worry about those things, do you? God guarantees the deliverance of our souls. You don't have to worry about your soul being lost in limbo somewhere. You don't have to worry about sitting in purgatory waiting for somebody to bail you out. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We're going to be there, and it is guaranteed. So when we're suffering, it is only the perspective of Jesus that replaces resentment with rejoicing. Let me read your story. Nancy and Ed Heisinga from Grand Rapids, Michigan. December of 1995, while they were at church rehearsing for the Festival of Lights program, their home burned to the ground. And that was not their only tragedy that year. Three months earlier, Nancy's longtime friend, Barb Post, who was a widow with two children, had died of cancer. Nancy and Ed had taken her two children 
Jeff and Katie into their home as part of their family, which was something they had promised Barb that they would do. And so when Ed and Nancy's house burned to the ground just before Christmas, it wasn't just their home that was lost. It was the home of two teenagers who had already lost their mother and their father. And as circumstances unfolded, irony went to work. The tragedy that forced the Heisingas from their home allowed Jeff and Katie to move back to theirs. And since their home had not yet been sold following their mother's passing, they and the Heisinger family moved in there the night after the fire. And on the following Saturday, neighbors organized a party to sift through the ashes and search for anything of value that might have survived. And one of the first indications they received of God's involvement in their struggle came as a result of that search. Somehow, a piece of paper survived, and on it were these words, contentment. Realizing that God has already provided everything we need for our present happiness. And to Nancy and Ed, this was like hearing God speak from a burning bush. Nancy's biggest frustration now is dealing with insurance companies and trying to assess their losses. Many possessions, irreplaceable personal items, photographs, uh, heirlooms handed down. But her highest priority is Jeff and Katie, along with her own children. The loss had been hardest on them. And she said, they don't have the history of God's faithfulness that Ed and I have. We have had years to make deposits in our faith account, but they haven't. We've learned that if you fail to stock up on faith when you don't need it, you won't have any when you do need it. And that has been our opportunity to use what we have been Interesting story. Our Father, we would ask that you would remind us of all of those many blessings of the things that we have in Christ. Even in the midst of difficulty, that hope which is sure and safe and secure, that hope like an anchor, steadfast to the soul, fastened to the rock that will not move, founded, dermot, founded deep in the Savior's love. Uh, encourage us as we face life each day as it comes, in Jesus' name.